two very important things are happening because first, cloud computing providers are offering general availability of the 128 core Zen 4C based AMD Epic CPUs. 128 cores in this socket, it's not an incremental improvement, it's actually an engineering change and kind of a milestone for AMD. It's a pretty big engineering win. We'll talk more about that. And the second thing is 3D vCache Genoa. Yeah, 1.1 gigabytes in a socket. I've been hands-on with these two systems and they're the fastest CPUs in the world by an absurdly monstrous margin at this point. <laughs> AMD's just killing it, literally and figuratively. Well, let's, let's take a closer look. First up is 4th Gen Epic with 3D vCache. AMD already spilled the beans on its capabilities and engineering the San Francisco event for AI and Data Center last month. These CPUs have 13 chiplets total, totaling up to 96 cores, and each of the 12 compute chiplets can also have an extra stack of level 3 cache. That's what's launching today, 1.1 gigabytes of L3 cache right on the CPU. In such a short time, 3D vCache started as kind of an R&D experiment with TSMC, but now it's sort of dominating the entire segment of the industry for technical computing. I mean, it's pretty cool when you can stand up an entire vertical on, it's like, ah, let's, let's do some R&D experiments, but 3D vCache is here to stay. If you do any type of computing where you require software products from Altair, Ansys, Cadence, Synopsys, and more, you're really missing out if you aren't looking at these CPUs with their Monster L3 cache. There are three products launching in the 3D vCache stack from 16 to 96 cores. The 16 core parts clock up to 4.2 gigahertz and is designed primarily for EDA and design and anywhere you're constrained by a per core licensing fee. And you want those cores to be as fast as possible no matter what. For my own benchmarks, I was seeing some impressive single thread gains over their Milan based 3D vCache counterparts. Those CPUs only launched about a year ago. Okay, maybe a little bit more than a year ago. Just been over a year, it's still about a year, it's madness. In the marketplace, these parts are in such high demand, and yes, the core counts are so high and so on and so forth, that a lot of people are opting for single socket servers. I mean, 96 cores and 12 memory channels in a single socket? Okay, I mean, that sounds good to me. Oh, and one other note. My local test system here with 1.5 terabytes of memory, that's so much memory I feel guilty it isn't doing something for some open source project every millisecond and I'm not actually using it. But these SP5 generation CPUs can technically support 6 terabytes of RAM per socket. If you need more than a terabyte or two of RAM, the cost delta between a 3D vCache CPU and a non-3D vCache CPU, just go ahead and get the 3D vCache. The more RAM that you have, especially that one terabyte and beyond boundary, uh, the cost is negligible when factored in the overall cost of the system and more cache can cache more memory more effectively. And that also kind of leads into machine learning which is kind of hot right now. A huge cache can make a difference there but it really depends. A lot of the algorithms have been optimized for not a lot of cache. More cores is more better first for AI to be sure but more cache can help as we're starting to see in some machine learning benchmarks. Even Zen 4 cores, I mean, they're really big and powerful cores. Some machine learning jobs do actually make sense to keep on the CPU for that reason. Don't believe me? Check out Neural Magic and their sparse zoo. These models have been sparsified, to use their word, to run sparsely on Epic CPUs. So it's no coincidence there's a lot of quotes from AMD folks there. 96 cores? Okay, I mean, that's really cool for that kind of workload, but what about 128 cores? The cloud monster density. That's Zen 4C, and Zen 4C is gonna do more cores, more better. <laughs> From 96 to 128 cores, you just add more cores, right? No, it's not that simple. Well, okay, yeah, it actually is that simple for AMD, but it's their own brilliance that has made them do this. This has flown under the radar of a lot of people, pay attention. So this is a 96 core CPU. This is, this is Genoa, this is not Bergamo. 96 cores. So each chiplet has eight CPUs, and then this thing in the middle, is your I.O. die. This is where your PCIe and your memory interconnects are. So in the socket here in our super micro motherboard, 12 memory channels, that all goes to the I.O. die and all of our PCIe 5 connectivity all goes to the I.O. die. The chiplets are behind the I.O. die. The chiplets talk directly to the I.O. die and the I.O. die talks to the rest of the system. Super micro and AMD and other vendors have to work together to qualify the entire platform. 
What AMD has done differently with Bergamo is it's actually fewer chiplets. There are only eight chiplets instead of 12 because each chiplet is 16 cores, but each chiplet is still a Zen 4 core. This is different from the Rome to Milan generation of Epic. In a sense, with this type of, it's still just Zen 4, but it's been shrunk a little bit, so we've got better power utilization. It means that AMD and their partners don't have to qualify an entire new platform to handle that. It really just drops in behind the I.O. die. By treating the, the compute chiplets almost like a peripheral, you, you end up really dramatically shaving the engineering time that you need to bring up new products. It's a new uh, lithography process. It's a new you know shrink, if you want to think of it as a shrink. But really, you haven't had to completely re-engineer the platform. I mean, reusing the I.O. die is not anything new, but you still would have to make changes to the platform, minimally like the Agiza version, as we saw from Rome to Milan. Because this is still just Zen 4, it's exactly a Zen 4 implementation, you don't have to do that. Uh, it, to get the shrink, to, you know, to fit 16 cores on a chiplet that's basically the same size as an existing chiplet, other than the shrink, they also had to eliminate the vias, so there won't be a Bergamo 128 core with extra V cache to get the, uh, the stacks of extra cache or anything like that. But I think that's going to be fine for AMD's Edge customers. They're able to customize the platform in a way that makes sense. Think about the possibilities this opens up. If AMD wanted to qualify an ARM chiplet, all of the engineering for the DDR5 and the PHY and the PCIe is already done. AMD could do that in secret and no one would ever know because all of the other physical interconnectivity, everything is already here. They just have to prototype a chiplet that plugs into the platform here behind the IO die and literally the entire rest of the platform is good to go. This is a serious competitive advantage that has flown under the radar, but now that cloud providers are taking up this 128 core Bergamo as fast as they possibly can, I have a feeling that uh, more people are going to notice. I mean, think about that. At the end of the day, it's a 128 core CPU with four fewer chiplets than this in basically the same physical design. What's not to love? Now, even though there's 16 cores in each chiplet, from an I.O. die perspective, it's still like as if it's talking to two 8-core chiplets. Doing it this way meant the I.O. die is 100% already validated. Those Zen 4C cores are exactly precisely the same Zen 4 cores from a, an electrical logic standpoint, so AMD doesn't have to work with their board partners to completely requalify all their existing solutions. That cuts the engineering time in half. And that's why I say this is an engineering win that's flown under a lot of everybody's radar. I mean, CPU engineering projects are years-long projects. Things like turn on a dime, that, that doesn't really apply to CPU engineering. And yet, AMD, by doing this, you can just swap out the chiplets. The onus is on them to do the qualification because everything else has been qualified. Memory controller, memory interface, physical board stuff. If it works with, you know, the Genoa Zen 4 chiplets, then it should also work with Zen 4 C chiplets or it should work with whatever other chiplets that AMD is cooking up in the background. This is huge from an engineering standpoint and does mean that AMD can turn on a dime as much as any company can for this kind of engineering. The only real downside is the boost clocks are maybe not quite as high when we're talking about 128 cores, and that's because these 128 core CPUs are in the same power envelope. Instead of having 12 compute dice, it's only eight, because 16 cores. Also, interestingly, there is a version of Zen 4C with SMT disabled for some cloud partners, I suppose. Uh, I asked AMD about this, and they said, well, some cloud providers don't want to sell symmetric multi-thread capabilities, presumably for security reasons. We, we don't really ask what the customer, the customer just said, ah, we don't really want SMT. Certainly for something like an Amazon EC2 micro instance, just giving someone one core with two threads, I mean, that's great. There's no reason not to do that from a security perspective or otherwise. But if someone's running, uh, you know, an open source database server on a slice of 128 core or a 256 core two socket system, then disabling SMT maybe makes sense because you don't want to leak information. Now for the overall performance breakdown of this 128 core parts, even though the boost clocks aren't quite as high, it's still insanely impressive. It's multimedia, right? You got a lot of cores or you got a lot of cache. What does multimedia look like? Well, the breakdown here is pretty interesting. Starting with SVT AV1, HEVC, Embry. Uh, the results here are pretty much as you'd expect. The 9784X is on top and dominating when we're talking about things like Embry and path tracing and, you know, anything with that. HEVC. The 9754 holds its own. Just remember that even though we're dealing with 16 cores per chiplet, 
we're still dealing with, you know, half the cache per core cluster. So 16 megabytes of L3 versus 32. You know, some sacrifices were made to get everything to fit on chip, but it doesn't really hurt it very much in most workloads at all. Timed compilation was also really interesting because, you know, I worked on Greg Crow Hartman's compilation system where more cores was always more better. But in this case, it seems like the good old 9654 dual 96 cores is pretty much the ruler across the board here. Okay, the 9784X was better in some scenarios, like if you're using the Ninja build system and you're building something larger like LLVM, you can shave a couple of seconds off of your build, but, but generally the regular Zen 4 cores do better than their Zen 4C counterparts. One DNN was also of particular interest because, you know, 128 cores, maybe it's going to do a little bit better. No, it seems like the loss of cache and the physical characteristics of those Zen 4C cores doesn't really do AMD any favors. Of course, the software has also improved since the last time I benchmarked this. I mean, the 96 core CPUs that we looked at, you know, six months ago have improved dramatically just because the software is catching up. Of course, one DNN, Intel still will dominate here because they've got hardware acceleration built in, but the gap has closed significantly with the 9784X processors. This also seems like a workload that is memory bandwidth bound or is somehow linked to memory bandwidth because the 9374F CPUs, which remember, those have dual GMI links to main memory, so you've got a lot more ability to get data in and out of those compute chiplets, and that really helps most of the one DNN benchmarks. Of course, conversely, you know, you got 128 cores fighting over the same 12 memory channels. It does, it does quite a bit worse for one DNN type workloads. I also took a look at R and RNN noise and Redis. There was nothing that was really super surprising here. The 9374F, of course, still dominates. You got to keep in mind some of the benchmarks here are single thread oriented. You know, in a real world scenario, you're probably not going to be using Redis in exactly the way that is configured in the benchmark. But if you've benchmarked a bunch of systems in this way, then you can kind of get a baseline for how things are going to go. These are very impressive results. Don't get me wrong. Neural Magic Deep Sparse was another thing that I wanted to take a look at. If you don't believe that AI can be done on CPUs, you should definitely take a look at Neural Magic and what they're doing with the sparsification of neural nets. I've covered that a few times on this channel before, and uh, yeah, it's pretty darn good. I think I'd rather have more cache than more cores. The 9784X is, is dominating pretty handily, but again, sometimes the 9374F pulls ahead. It depends on what you're doing, probably down to memory bandwidth. Probably down to memory bandwidth on a per core basis. You know, each core has physically more memory bandwidth available to it. Of course, that's not true for image classification and deep sparse. You know, we're doing ResNet uh, image net calculations or ResNet image classification. And the 9654 dominates pretty much everything with a very nearly identical score. 9784X with the more cache, not really helping. I have a feeling that could be fixed with some tuning of the model and what Neural Magic is doing here. It's probably set up for 32 megabytes of L3 cache, not using a lot beyond that, but but maybe that could be improved in software. RocksDB is another interesting one. RocksDB is definitely a favorite of, of Intel, and there's a really interesting thing going on here. Depending on whether you're doing read or update while uh, reading or update while writing or write random, you get different performance characteristics depending on what exactly it is that you're doing with RocksDB. In some scenarios, the 128 core part will pull ahead. In some scenarios, the large cache part will pull ahead. And in some scenarios, the 9374F with its dual GMI links will pull ahead. It just depends on what you're doing with RocksDB. It's pretty interesting stuff. PyBench is one of those benchmarks where it's single thread-ish. It's really a benchmark at single threads, and the 9374F takes the crown here because of its insanely high single thread clock speed. But the 9784X will scale better because it's got more cores and will be able to run more in parallel, and is pretty much the champ on this chart. Running tests with Nginx and Apache, you know, just the sheer number of connections per second. Well, the 9754 dominates, but you got to be a little bit careful with this benchmark because sometimes the 9784 or the 9654 will come out on top depending on the geometry that you set up for Nginx, like how many processes are going to run independently. There's a lot to factor in with how you actually set up your Nginx test, but doing 4,000 parallel calculations, it can clear 230,000 connections per second on a well-tuned 9754 system. 128 cores 
outrunning your 96 core counterpart. Yeah, it's possible. Also tested Neat Bench and Geek Bench just to give us an idea of what we were looking at for all the different systems. Geek Bench doesn't really take a huge advantage of the sheer number of cores here, so a lot of the time the 9374F will dominate just because Geekbench and some of these other benchmarks are not really fully loading the system, but nevertheless, it is interesting to compare to. PHP Bench, which is basically a single thread benchmark, shows us that we're not really working with a lot of difference for these web server type workloads between all of the different CPUs. I mean, the 9374F comes out on top because this is basically a single thread benchmark, but there really isn't much of a difference between the 9754 and the 9654, the difference between 96 and 128 cores. For a lot of PHP type workloads, the extra L3 cache that you give up by moving up to 128 cores doesn't really make a lot of difference. And we see why someone who needs 128 cores or 256 cores in a single system will benefit greatly from having that many more cores in you know, a single system. Also through inspect JBB for good measure, uh, this is one of the few comparisons that I have for ARM. I don't have an ARM system for comparison, but, you know, Ampere at Computex, there was definitely a lot of fun, interesting stuff that I learned at Computex about ARM and their platform, and I can't wait to get my hands on, on one of the ARM systems to play around with it. But I'm pretty sure this Spec JBB benchmark just blew out of the water what we were looking at from the ARM system. The 9754 with 150,000, that's the composite max uh, JOPS estimated score here. Uh, is sort of nuts. The uh, composite critical JOPS estimated at 92,518. Again, that is, I think, the fastest speed that I have ever seen from any system. Truly breathtaking. Just for fun, I also ran some comparison benchmarks on uh, what we were benchmarking last year with the launch of the 7773X, you know, the Milan based generation. And it's anywhere from 25% faster to more than 200% faster. It just depends on what you're doing. I mean, X Compact 3D and Compact 3D benchmarking down to four seconds versus 17.7 for the 7773X. That's not just core, you know, IPC improvements. That's improvements in the platform, memory, bandwidth, DDR5, etc., etc. Molecular Dynamics Simulation, 47 frames per second versus 31 from the previous best, the 7773X. Running the NWCAM Buckyball simulation, uh, you know, 1700 versus 2200 previously. Okay, that's about the uplift you'd expect, but this benchmark is a little bit of an outlier in that the performance improvement here is what you'd expect, not dramatic. From 7400 to 3700 in the WRF 4.2.2 benchmark, that's a, that's a, that's a doubling. We've, we've more than doubled in a generation. In just a year! A year! depending on what you were doing, if you had a cluster of these, it might have made sense for you to just wait a year for things to double in speed before buying your cluster to solve your problem. That's that's an impressive generation on generation improvement. And to be sure, it's not just your IPC. It's your whole platform. It's the platform benefit. Even things like Blender, like the BMW classroom scene, software improvements, IPC uplift, and platform improvements move you from 15 seconds to do the BMW to 9. There's all kinds of interesting tidbits in these. Be sure to check out the benchmark results linked below. I mean, the results here speak for themselves. It still fits in a 400 watt power envelope, 400 watt per socket. AMD's already got a commanding lead for general compute in server CPUs. And now they've sort of specialized for even higher density or even more cache. I mean, 20% more density in the same power envelope for these large cloud providers, plus also capturing the whole EDA, computational fluid dynamics and specialized compute field compute segment, server segment, I mean, pretty much anywhere that can benefit from a large CPU cache, AMD looks like they've got that engineering process locked up nicely. AMD's got a part for all of this, 128 cores, 12 memory channels, a reasonable single thread performance. It's sure looking like AMD is racking up a lot of wins, even in mass production. Impressive results across the whole Genoa family. I mean, you might be able to replace your dual socket servers with a single socket and still get more than a 20% performance bump, even if you bought your servers just two or three years ago. That kind of gen-on-gen -gen uplift, even versus AMD's own products, I can't recall another time that we've seen this in the server market. I mean, AMD is the relentless execution machine, and they're showing no signs of slowing down. I mean, it really is genuinely impressive. 
If you have a project or something you'd like to run on one of these systems, uh, reach out and let's connect. Let me know. I, I would love to take a look at other real world workloads and run these. Just for my own experimentation, running you know web servers and web servers with acceleration and taking a look at the Pensando accelerator in conjunction with how much compute you can save by doing the compute on the Pensando PCIe card as opposed to on the CPU and then 128 cores and the density and doing wireline 25 and 50 gigabit ethernet. It really makes me not want to work on systems that aren't you know, DDR5 and PCIe5 because things have come so far. The, it's, it's, it's a watershed moment in that the floor of performance here is so high that pretty much everything else really is fairly obsolete. I mean, don't get me wrong, you, you know, older parts, the performance is still really good, but this is another head and shoulders leap generation on generation. That's very, very impressive. We've got some other coverage coming and specific system setups like our single socket system here based around a Supermicro H13 SSL motherboard. And it's amazing what you can do in an ATX form factor even given the footprint of the CPU has become monstrous. I'm on Wondolus to level one, this has been a quick preview of the large cache and Bergamo CPUs. Uh, our full links to our Ferronix benchmarks are below, but we've also got some other benchmarks coming up. Stay tuned for that. I'm Wendell, this is Level 1. I'm signing out. You can find me in the Level 1 forum.